We are live Sunday, February 20th with Professor William Horn of Villanova University to dig deep in the Reconstruction era and the role African Americans played in it. Hi everyone, happy holidays. Welcome to Genealogy Adventures. I'm Brian Sheffy. And I'm Donya Williams. We have a great show today. We do, and I'm going to get straight into the introductions. As always, thank you for spending the next hour with us at home or wherever you're watching. So today we have Dr. William Horn. He's an Arthur J. Ennis postdoctoral fellow at Villanova University and also holds a PhD in history from George Washington University. His research focuses on racial capitalism and Black revolutionary organ organizing in the United States, and especially the system of carceral capitalism, what we call the prison pipeline, um, white Americans have worked to maintain since the destruction of chattel slavery. He is the co-founder and editor of the Archivist History Review and can be followed on Twitter at W.I. Horn, and Horn is spelled with an E. And welcome to the show, Dr. Will. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, that is perfect. How are you? I'm doing well. How are y'all? Good, I'm fine good. and just really pleased to have you on the show. So I'm going to start with something really easy. Um, even I'm not really sure when Reconstruction in the United States officially began. Can you talk, um, talk us through a little bit about that? You know, the, the year and the circumstances around it? Yeah, that's a great question, and there's a lot of debate around it. Actually, um, many historians uh, started in 1862, which is when um, the uh, the Union Army um, or the U.S. Army um, retakes uh, New Orleans and the area around New Orleans and South Louisiana um, and starts to sort of think through what it means to uh, bring rebellious states, that is the, the Confederate states, uh, back into the Union. Um, and so... Um, as they're thinking through this, they're thinking through um, sort of the future of, of slavery in the U.S. And so one of the things that's interesting about that um, is that, you know, it is unclear uh, for, for white Northerners whether or not uh, they, in fact, want slavery to end. And so sort of a famous example of this is the Emancipation Proclamation covers areas that are not under Union control uh, when Lincoln issues the proclamation, including South Louisiana. Um, and so, it, you know, areas that uh, the Union Army, the, the, the U.S. Army, freed. Um, th these were not areas where enslaved people were freed, right, uh, immediately under the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, and so we can see sort of a step-by-step -step process um, during Reconstruction, if we start it early um, in 1862, uh, where Black Americans play a central role in asserting what they want Reconstruction to look like and what they want sort of life after the war to look like. I mean, so I lean kind of towards that earlier starting point, um, other historians have, have started it as late as 1865 or 1866, and so after the end of the Civil War, um, and after uh, sometimes Lincoln's assassination, um, and uh, and you know they have sort of a different ideas about um, why they might start it then, but I, I lean towards that earlier uh, beginning point. Okay, and just as I'm a little bit fuzzy about when it began, and you explained why, so thank you very much for that. I'm also a little bit fuzzy about when it officially ended, because it doesn't seem as though it was just like a clear delineation, like it's now over. That's right. Um, and yeah, and so there's, there's a, again, a lot of debate between historians about when is the best time um, to sort of end it. And I, um, I, what makes the most sense to me, I guess, is to look at Kind of the local situation. And so Reconstruction, uh, let's say in North Louisiana, uh, where there's very little um, sort of U.S. Army presence to help, uh, you know, Black Louisianans assert their rights there. Um, that Reconstruction, you know, in the way that I write it and think about it, ended earlier um, than in places where there was more of a U.S. Army presence. 
um, or where there were larger uh, black populations that could sort of look to one another for protection, right? Um, there, the sort of the standard answer to that question is 1876. Um, and so with the election of 1876, um, you have kind of a, the official withdrawal of the US Army um, from New Orleans and other areas where it had been stationed to, again, protect uh, black rights, to protect uh, ostensibly uh, black equality. Um, and then you have later dates too uh, that sort of tiptoe towards uh, the beginnings of the Jim Crow era. Um, and I think there's a strong case to be made for any of those. Uh, but I think when we really look at kind of what's going on locally, we get a best, the sort of the best sense of what reconstruction meant to people locally. Um, and and by looking at that, then like when we should think about it ending. Um, and so I think there really is a pretty strong argument for saying, you know, it ended earlier when uh, Black locals there had fewer rights um, and it ended later in places uh, where they could exercise those rights, let's say the right to vote um, or the rights of citizenship a little bit later on um, in the process. And I'd like to pick up on that point because <clears throat> I guess the way that I've always envisioned um, Reconstruction is that it was supposed to be the, the start of what I, what I refer to as America 2.0. United States 2.0. I don't know how close that would match to the beginning, but in terms of the, the start of Reconstruction, what was it meant to actually do and what problem was it meant to actually solve? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and I guess there are sort of two ways of thinking about that question. Um, the first is that it had to address this issue of what to do with sort of the, the people who seceded from the U.S., the, the white supremacist Southerners who uh, fought in the Confederate Army and who led the rebellion, so who seceded from the U.S. Um, there had to be some way to deal with them and um, either reincorporate them into the U.S. As, as full citizens or not. And there's a lot of debate about that, um, you know, during Reconstruction. And the second is, um, you know, what status um, formerly enslaved people should have uh, in the U.S. And again, there's a lot of debate about that. Um, and I think we get the strongest answers um, from Black Americans themselves uh, staking out a claims to citizenship, staking out uh, claims to the right to vote, uh, to rights to property, um, to, you know, rights to self-determination. Um, and, uh, and so I guess in many respects, um, they answer those questions. Um, Black Americans also actually um, you know, by and large in, in the South help answer that question of what to do with former Confederates. Um, they help decide that, you know, that the right to vote should be universal, right? Um, and so that's a question that's decided um, in, you know, 1868, 1869, um, you know, and Black Americans play a role in that, right? That uh, Black men should have the right to vote and, you know, white men should as well, right? Um, and so there really is a sense uh, that there is a, a, a re- founding of, of, of America. Eric Foner, uh, a famous reconstruction historian, calls it uh, America's unfinished revolution. Um, and so there is this kind of idea of re-founding uh, the U.S. that I think um, a lot of scholars uh, talk about. And in terms, so what we think of as reparations, mm -hmm. was that even considered? Was that, a, was that even a thing in those, those early years of reconstruction? Yeah, and that's a major demand of local Black politics um, across the Lower South um, and even into sort of the Upper South and the, today what we would call the Midwest um, is demands for land, um, you know, in sort of some form of compensation for uh, having been enslaved, right? Um, because the idea, and this is something that Dr. King uh, talks about, his famous sort of bootstraps uh, quote, he talks about like, that it's a cruel jest to, um, you know, tell a bootless man, right, that, it, that he needs to pull himself up by his bootstraps and to sort of throw enslaved people out into uh, the world, in a, in a world that's governed by access to property um, without any access to property. A world that's governed by access to education without having had access to education um, is kind of like intrinsically unjust, unfair. Um, and this is an argument that, again, formerly enslaved people themselves were making. It's a huge deal. Um, and you do see uh, examples of what today we would call reparations or what they called the land question or land redistribution um, at the time, for sure. So I kind of agree with that quote because, and again, I think 
the, the visceral reactions of a pocket of white Americans, they act as though the people who were freed from slavery had only just been enslaved. We are talking about people who had been enslaved for centuries. Okay. So you're talking about centuries of bootless people, much less a bootstrap. And that I guess that's the one thing that I struggle with about Reconstruction, what I've read about it and what Donnie and I've uncovered it while we were while we have been researching our family history, is how do a people who have never known freedom don't know what freedom is? They've obviously dreamt of it, but the real practice, you know, there, there's no there's no freedom 101 course. Right. There's no course where you can have a little tick list. These are the things you're gonna have to have control over once, you know, for your own person, your family, providing all that stuff once you're free. How do people realistically expect enslaved from a long line of enslaved people who had every aspect of their life controlled be expected to just kind of get on with things without any kind of material support? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. And that, again, is one that, um, you know, Black political figures raised at the time. Um, and I think it's worth noting that during sort of the very early stages of Reconstruction, um, so like those 1862 um, to 1865, where the war is still going on, um, the U.S. Army kind of helps answer that question. Um, and the way that they answer it is that for the most part, they're, they're concerned with Black people working. They're not concerned with access to rights, access to property, with access to education, and any issues of equality. Uh, they're, they're concerned uh, with making sure that uh, people who had been working plantations are forced back onto the plantations. And so in Louisiana, you know, in this sort of very early phase of Reconstruction, uh, we get what's called the Banks Plan, which actually becomes the format for Reconstruction nationally. Um, and the Banks Plan essentially stipulates that uh, Black Louisianans and later Black Americans have to sign an annual contract. Um, they, they will get paid once a year uh, based on that contract that eventually becomes the system. Um, and, uh, and they're sort of stuck in place on the plantations and, and that's it. Um, you know, and, and so I guess, you know, part of the answer that we get, which is totally inac inadequate, um, is, is one that is simply, um, kind of a, a byproduct of wanting to make sure that, um, that black Louisianans and later black Americans are producing as much stuff, uh, as possible to help the Northern armies. Um, and to sort of boost the economy. Um, that's not a just answer, but that is the answer that, um, you know, that the, the, the government uh, came up with. Donnie, did you want to jump in there with you? Because I know that the, the labor contracts, they're, they're important to both of us, but yeah. just, just to talk about the, the wording. Well, first of all, I didn't even know that they only got paid at the end of the year or once a year. So that, mm. that in itself is, is just an amazing... Um, that that's amazing. I didn't know that. But one of the things that I found to be very interesting when it came to the labor contracts was the wording and how mm -hmm. it really went right back into slavery to a certain degree. I we found labor contracts where they made comments like, um, if your children get out of line, I have the opportunity to beat them, you know, mm -hmm. in so many words. That's what it was saying. But then I also found you know, with my two times great grandmother, she was completely cared for. So it was like the backside of of a labor contract where on one side he was saying, I'm going to beat all your children. I'm going to beat everybody. You can't have this. You can't have that. You can only do this. You can only do that. And then you flip it over. He says, oh, I'm going to give you $6 a month and you're going to get this and I'll take care of your children. It was a totally different thing. Yeah. So, I mean, what? Why did it happen that way? Do you mm. do you have any insight in that? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think that the, one of the biggest reasons, um, honestly, is just the legal profession. Um, there are almost no black lawyers in the U.S. Um, you know, in 1865 or in 1862 or whenever we're starting Reconstruction, right? Um, and the reason for that, of course, is because of slavery, right? And because of local laws, um, access to education, right? Laws that ban uh, Black Americans from getting an education, things like that. Um, and so what winds up happening, of course, is that like, you know, there's the enforcement 
you know, it, it skews towards the, the white supremacists, right? Because they are the ones who are sort of saying, okay, well, this is a contract that's fair, right? They're the ones who are in courts, right? They're the judges, they're the lawyers, and they can say, yeah, sure, it's totally fair to only get paid once a year. It's totally fair to, you know, and of course, this is preposterous, right? Um, but as we know, like, it really doesn't matter. Like, the Supreme Court can say whatever they want to say, right? What It just matters, like, what it is that they desire, the outcome that they desire, right? I mean, that is true uh, now as it, it was true then, um, unfortunately. And so I think that's one of the biggest reasons. Um, the other reason, again, though, is that I think uh, people in power more broadly uh, in the U.S. government were mostly concerned with making sure that formerly enslaved people worked and made as much money as possible uh, for their former owners, um, right? Uh, and then also sort of for the, the larger U.S. economy, uh, which had been suffering uh, during the war because of the war, you know? And so there is a sense in which, um, you know, as with the pre-war period where the brunt of the labor and the brunt of the profit uh, comes from black workers. The same thing is true after the war as well. And in many respects, the war debt um, is paid by the underwaged work um, of black workers during mm -hmm. reconstruction. And that's a good point about the, the lack of black lawyers, because even though there was a sizable population of free people of color, mm -hmm. they were excluded from the legal process. Because again, most of them had to have white guardians. They were they were almost treated like they were minor children. Even if they were, you know, successful, they had money in the bank, they owned land, yeah. they too were shut out from education. They too were shut out from, from even entering the legal profession. Um, so great. again, there was just, you know, there, there was just a lack of legal representation by someone who looked like you and actually understood kind of what you'd been through. And I mean, you know, like it, it makes sense that this would be, you know, this the situation after slavery, right? In most of the U.S., uh, Black Americans could not even give testimony in court against a white American, much less, you know, actually wield any kind of legal power, right? And so, of course, they're totally, you know, um, you know, excluded from the the legal processes, um, and and that's devastating uh, during Reconstruction. And, and we see that play out in the contracts. We see that play out. Uh, in assault cases, we see that play out uh, across the reconstruction experience. So when do we start seeing, and again, this is before women could vote, so I'm not being sexist when I say this, when do we start seeing African-American men during reconstruction entering into the political process? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and so I guess there's two, <laughs> there's, it's a complicated, there's a complicated, everything's complicated, right? Um, but there's, I guess, two ways of answering it. And so one is um, sort of thinking about entering the political process um, as being like, let's say, uh, an agitator, like a protester, right? Um, as uh, demanding rights, you know, and that's something that happened during the war. Um, so, you know, for example, black soldiers um, did not get the same pay uh, as white soldiers, um, you know, and they protested that throughout the wartime experience, right? Um, many of them, in fact, were shot for refusing to, you know, accept these subpar wages uh, shot by the government that they were, you know, ostensibly fighting for, um, you know, and and so um, I think I think we have to start that political discussion there, even though, of course, like you know, black men could not vote at that point, right? But I think really uh, where we start to see, um, you know, that change is in 1867 and 1868, uh, where for the first time in early 1868. Um, black men across the South are allowed to vote uh, by the Reconstruction Acts. Um, and this is really because of the, the massive organizing um, that Black veterans do, um, and also because of sort of the horrific um, racist backlash, um, you know, through which uh, white supremacists massacre, um, you know, dozens upon dozens of Black voting rights activists, especially in uh, New Orleans uh, in 1866. Uh, but in other places across the country um, that kind of stoked national outrage um, and convinced white Northerners that, uh, that they had to do something more um, to, to guarantee uh, basic civil rights uh, for Black Americans. So I want to, uh, okay, so you made a comment about, about them, you know, being a part of what was being done. And then Brian just earlier, you know, said how, did they expect for 
people straight out of slavery to be able to run stuff. Apparently, they were able to run stuff <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> because they did make those. They did. They did do this massive organization of getting mm-hmm. black. Because that that was one of the things that was shown mm-hmm. in the in the homework that I did earlier today um, about talking about the fact that African Americans, you know we we weren't that they weren't able to quote unquote run stuff but yet they did all of these things it was in that that was the kind of thing that made me start looking at reconstruction because as i was researching i started to learn that during mm-hmm. that 12 to 15 year period we actually did come out the gate running we actually mm-hmm. did come out the gate knowing how to read knowing how to take care of things you know we actually did know how to do those things so is it safe to say that because we came out making the type of strides that we did at that time period mm-hmm. um were they nervous yeah i think that's a really good way to put it um and it reminds me of uh, kind of one of my famous, our uh, favorite um, black politicians uh, from Louisiana. Um, and we were talking about him earlier off stage, uh, but John Gare, who um, introduced the uh, the amendment uh, in the Louisiana state constitution as black Louisianans were rewriting the state constitution, right? Mm-hmm. As you know, they're coming out of the gate running. They're rewriting the state constitution. Um, he's the person who uh, proposed the amendment for free and fair elections. Um, he was formerly enslaved. He was a carpenter. Um, as far as we can tell, he taught himself how to read and write. Um, it is an incredible story um, and uh, becomes a powerhouse of Louisiana politics. Um, and, and I think uh, demonstrates exactly that, that uh, even, you know, ha- coming from, you know, horrible circumstances and, and circumstances that, um, you know, that didn't afford him the education that, that he and so many others deserved, right, was still able to seize that opportunity. Right, and to make sure that uh, that there were equal rights across the board uh, in Louisiana, at least on paper. And again, Donnie has got a perfect ancestral relation that almost a poster boy for this. Mm-hmm. So he's born yeah. enslaved. He's born enslaved in South Carolina. 1870 census. He can't read. He can't write. 1880 census. Not only can he read and write, he's a reverend, and he's been to he's been to Wilberforce University. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was like in a five-year period, he became the smartest man on earth. Uh, it's because he, I mean, I mean, that's just the best way that I can say it. But it, his, his reason for running and going into hiding was because of a political situation right. that happened after the Reconstruction era, but during that time period where they were still trying to push black people back Mm -hmm. into slavery and to the black codes and, and all of those things. Right. So something that we chatted about briefly in our, our virtual green room is I was talking about the, and even tweeted you about it this morning about the term interchangeable terms now, but let's start with black radicals and then kind of segue into the now where we're now called black socialists and and black communists. I've always been curious about even the beginning when they're just calling us radicals because we weren't, even though we were very vocal about the rights of black people in this country back in the 1860s, we weren't just fighting for our rights. They, you know, poor whites benefited as much from what we were fighting for as, as any other population. So I, why is this, why was that such a trigger term back then? And why is it such a trigger term now? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I guess the, the term radical in particular um, is important here for two reasons. Um, one is because uh, the Republican party, the, the sort of left wing of that party. And that used to be the the leftist party um, in the US. It is not today. Um, But the left wing of that party called itself the radicals. Um, You know, and so part of that, you know, the the radical Republican terminology, right? uh, Part of that simply comes from, you know, the name of that wing of the Republican Party, right? Um, But I think, you know, as with many political terms, right, it's used in a disparaging way, quite clearly uh, during Reconstruction and having to do with race, right? And so uh, when you sort of tie, um, you know, the, 
white conservatives start using the term like black radicals, right? Um, or um, black Republicans uh, is sort of the other phrase that they use. And they don't mean literally black voters. Um, they're trying to sort of say that any white American who supports equality is in fact black, right? Um, and so the idea is, is you know, sort of basic race baiting, right? Um, and that's something that we see time and time again uh, in U.S. politics, especially uh, after World War I, um, during the first red scares, um, we see uh, red baiting and race baiting go hand in hand. Um, that really begins uh, during the Reconstruction era, but it's a pattern that un unfortunately um, has defined our politics for generations. So let me understand this correctly. If you fight for the first, you know, the, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights to be equally applicable to everybody, you're a radical. Right. And, and you're, a, you're as, as a, and they're speaking to white northerners, right? As they're saying this, or, um, you know, even white southerners um, who initially support reconstruction, they're saying, look, um, if you support this, then you're actually black, right? And so they're race baiting there. They're, the racist language um, is clear. Uh, and, you know, it's also worth pointing out that the Democratic Party of the day, um, and again, that was the conservative party at the time, um, they ran under the banner of, you know, a white man's party. Like that was really, that was their actual slogan in 1868 was it's a white man's country, let white men rule. That was their actual slogan, right? And so these racist ideas, um, you know, were central to um, the politics of the moment, right? Um, and I think that we can see, of course, versions of them um, impacting our politics throughout our history, again, in like really um, unfortunate ways. One of the things that, um, that your question raises for me, though, that I think is really interesting and important um, is that we do actually have, um, you know, a strong tradition of black leftists in our country, um, you know, and that's something that I think um, tends to get glossed over. You know, I, I teach a lot of history, um, you know, and students are often surprised at a few things. And one of the things that they're often surprised at um, are, you know, thinkers like W.E.B. Du Bois, who is a famous Black Marxist thinker, and his ideas like everyone's evolved over time, right? But um, there is a sense that, you know, we have treated Black political thought as one thing. And of course, mm. that's not the case. It, it's so many things, right? Black people, like all other people, like have all kinds of different ideas, um, you know, and there is this truly incredible um, Black leftist, you know, tradition in, in our country um, that I think does, it, it is important, um, that does tend to get glossed over. Um, and part of it is, you know, because of that socialist label uh, that we were talking about. Mm. Wow. And of course, now it's, you, it's just bandied about to just close conversations, right. just close all of that down. Yeah. So it sounds yeah. like what we're doing today what they were doing back then. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately. I, including, I, yeah. Including political shenanigans, because that 1860, was it 68, 67 election? Yeah, the 68 that, election. I mean, Reconstruction elections were just terribly violent um, and unstable. Uh, the 68 election was one that was like that. Uh, and the 76 election was also one where there were contested results. People were trying to overturn it. Um, local elections were often that way. The 1872 uh, Louisiana state election was one where the losing white conservative candidate just refused to concede defeat. He set up a shadow government, um, you know, and white paramilitary movement um, and eventually did overthrow the government. Um, they, they were kicked back out of power by the U.S. Army. Um, but, you know, there are parts of this story that seem like really disturbingly familiar. Um, you know, these are demons that, you know, we have yet to face, uh, at least as white America as a country. Um, and, you know, that we're continuing to sort of pay the price for, I think, as, as a larger community. Donia, I can, I can almost channel your energy at the minute <laughs> thinking, this is why this needs to be taught. Yeah. Because really what we've been what we've been going through, there's just there literally is nothing new under the sun. And if you don't know your history, you are doomed to repeat it. So with that being said, because I'm so glad because I'm sitting here like, okay, so with all of that not knowing that, why is it not taught? What is the reason that the reconstruction era isn't taught? 
in detail in schools? That's a great question. And it's one that um, the uh, Black intellectual W.E.B. Du Bois that I mentioned a moment ago um, considered in detail at the end of his book, Black Reconstruction. Um, and so like I would advise anyone, you know, I we have a free PDF, I think, in the chat or something that everyone can look at. Um, but his uh, chapter, The Propaganda of History, um, addresses that in detail. Um, and one of his um, ideas is that white America is simply ashamed of this past, um, maybe ashamed in a couple of ways, like one, um, in that uh, Black Americans, as Danya put it, did hit the ground running, right? Um, and are capable, right, um, of changing democracy and equality for the better in our country. Um, and white Americans, in fact, you know, broadly uh, rejected that. Uh, and that that's sort of is the story of the end of Reconstruction. And so there's some shame in that, that, you know, we still have yet to live up to our national founding values of democracy and equality. Um, you know, and so, you know, I think part of the issue there is, is shame, but I think it's also an issue of power. Um, you know, there is an opportunity, truly, and it remains today, uh, for us to have a vibrant egalitarian democracy. And that is uh, something that white conservatives are working overtime uh, to prevent and to, pre to, prevent, to prevent even the teaching of that history right now, today, as we speak. Um, you know, in all 50 states, there are, you know, movements afoot, right, uh, to do uh, something uh, along those lines. Um, and and there, that, I think, is an issue of power um, because, again, there is this sort of ideology that um, that is America, that, that we already have equality, that we already have democracy, and that we always have, right? Or maybe after slavery, you know, we had equality, or maybe after civil rights, but it's definitely, we have it now, right? Um, and so, you know, thinking through the legacies of these systems of racist oppression is something that white conservatives then and now simply could not permit, right? And so I think that's, you know, the, maybe a long answer, but I think that's why, uh, you know, it is, it hasn't been taught in the way that it, that it should have been. Um, I, I didn't learn a lot of these things when I was growing up in high school, um, yeah. in college, um, a lot of these things I discovered in graduate school. Um, and that's just, that's not acceptable, um, you know, and, and that doesn't promote, um, you know, a functional democracy uh, that, that we have to go to graduate school or do, you know, all kinds of extra homework, right, to, to learn these things. Mm -hmm. So not wanting to skip over some other parts of sure. reconstruction, but um, one of the thing, one of the other questions I wanted to ask you is as the, you know, Lincoln got assassinated, then we have President Johnson, um, who was perhaps not the best, best friend to, to African Americans right. in that time period. But then we start getting a really robust resistance from white Southerners. And what I wanted to ask you about was the white Southerners were telling the Northerners, we understand the Negro and you don't. And my pushback, and that really angers, the part that really angers me is it almost seems like the North accepted that narrative, forgetting that the North when in the colonial period were enslavers, there were black people there, there were Black people going all the way back to New Amsterdam and New Sweden. Later, but still during the slavery period, we have free people of color communities popping up in Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, early Michigan. Why did the North allow the South to get away with that narrative? We know the Black, we know Negroes, y'all up, up in the North don't. Yeah, that's, that's a really great question. Um, and I think it speaks to sort of a larger failure uh, of ours, uh, maybe ideologically, to address what happened um, in, in the way that Reconstruction ended, um, because it's it's kind of confusing, right? Like Black Southerners, right? They demand equal rights. Okay, like we get that. We're on the same page, right? Um, they get access to some voting, right? Um, and maybe there's some voter suppression, right? But like they do vote, right? We get that. Okay, that makes sense. And so then how does it end? Like that part doesn't make sense, you know? Um, and I think the, the issue is like the white Northerners and white Southerners shared a different racist vision of black Americans. 
Um, and so, you know, in the North, for instance, uh, we have like what are called black laws in, before emancipation um, in places like Ohio, um, Indiana, Illinois, um, black Americans were not even legally allowed to set foot in Oregon, according to the state constitution. Mm -hmm. Right. And so we have a massive racism problem, like in the white North, you know, and so in some ways, I think white Northerners are sympathetic to uh, white Southerners racist ideas, right, about how to deal with black Americans. Um, they have different racist ideas, you know, and so they are anti slavery. Part of their commitment to anti slavery, not all of it, but part of it, for many of them is that they think that slavery disadvantages white people, poor working white people, and that if we can get rid of slavery, then mm. it'll be a country that's better for poor working white people. Um, and so the precursor actually to the Republican Party um, was the Free Soil Party. Um, and the idea there is that there should be free soil uh, so that white Americans can move on to that free soil, which had been conveniently cleared through genocide, right, of indigenous people, right, move on to that soil and like fully become Americans as landholders, right. Um, and so that is kind of like at, at the baseline, right, of a lot of these ideas uh, about white northern, you know, um, attitudes towards black Americans. It's, it's not a rosy picture, you know, and, and maybe that's another reason why um, we don't learn about a lot of this stuff in the way that we should uh, is because it makes white northerners in addition to white southerners look quite bad um you know and well, so i think is that i'm 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 gonna have to interrupt you sure. is that a is that an excuse i mean is... no, of course not <laughs> <laughs> i mean because it to me one of the things that I've realized in learning reconstruction, and then we have a, a, a good enough uh, amount of questions that mm. I've been putting stars beside to make sure I get them. Um, but to me, and this was something that was actually said by by one of our uh, people that was watching, are they ashamed or were they scared? Because had as as an African American child in school had i learned the greatness of my people like you learned the greatness of your people where would that have placed me you know how much confidence would that have given me how much how much you know would it would it have built my self esteem in a better direction than what it actually you know went through i, I mean is it like like sharon mott said is it is it shame or is it scared? And and how do we get past this whole, how do we get past all of that? Just let's get to that point where we now know that this stuff did happen. And, and this, instead of calling it critical race theory, it's the truth. And now you want to teach the truth. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I will be teaching the truth. So that's just, that's just going to happen. Um, but <laughs> you know, I, I, I think that's a really good point about scared, right? Um, you know, that like we, there are power relationships, right? That are implicated. There's systems of powers. We can't talk about having a meritocracy in this country, a meritocracy. Um, if in fact, the U.S. has systematically denied Black Americans their rights since before Reconstruction, right? Much less during and after, right? Um, and so I, I think that's a very important point, right? Um, that, you know, they're focusing on, you know, using uh, Black Americans and suppressing, you know, Black knowledge and Black greatness, right? And Black equality, um, you know, both like in a literal sense, but also like an ideological sense. You know, there, there's, there's an argument to be made there, right? That like, we can't, have, you know, like mass voter suppression. We can't have a Jim Crow era. We can't have, you know, I don't know, mass incarceration, things like that, um, you know, underfunded schools. If we acknowledge, in fact, that like this is what the government has been up to for a very, very, very long time, um, you know, and, and I think that that is, is unfortunately scared. Is I think scared makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Now, something else that Donnie and I feel quite strongly about is, again, you have a large, you, know, you get a number of Black men who are now either in state legislatures or national legislatures. 
they're you know rewriting state constitutions as you as you were mentioning before they did the same thing in, in South Carolina right. so they're you know rewriting state legis legislations they're passing state laws they're passing national laws they're having national discourse and then what we're fed in the history books is oh well the black people didn't know what they were doing so we pulled them out of politics and pretty much virtually made it impossible for them to ever get back there until recent times. What was that process? Who was leading that charge and kind of how did that process even happen? You're talking about the uh, the process of sort of rebranding what happened during Reconstruction as, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that's, that's a great question. Uh, and so I guess the, the simplest, most straightforward answer is uh, William Dunning. Um, you know, in the what we call uh, as historians, we call the Dunning School, which is just a group of historians um, in the 1880s, 90s, um, in, through the early, you know, 20th century, um, who were engaged in this sort of production of racist lies. Um, there's really no other way to say it, right? Because that isn't what happened. In fact, Black Americans were not incompetent, right? They passed laws, they engaged in public discourse, they ran newspapers. Right. They did all, all of the things, um, you know, and, and instead, you know, what happened, of course, is that white conservatives, um, you know, at the end of a gun, you know, forced them to stop doing these things and often murdered black Americans for engaging in that um, political activity or, or ran them into exile. Right. Um, but John Gare, you know, the person I mentioned earlier was assassinated. It sounds like, Danya, your ancestor had to go into hiding or something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. We're again, again, engaging in this activity. You don't go into hiding for, you know, being incompetent and having to give power back, right? Exactly. Like, hiding because <laughs> someone is trying to kill you, right? To take power from you, right? Um, and so I think that's, you know, a really important point. They, they knew this was a lie at the time they were telling it, but they were telling it at an important moment, right? Like I said, 1880s, 1890s, this is the very moment Confederate statues are going up across the country, not just in the lower South, but across the country, at the very moment that Jim Crow laws are being passed in the deep South uh, that, you know, forbid Black Southerners from voting, right? Um, and at the very moment that we have this repressive Jim Crow apartheid state being put together, one that is in fact affirmed by the Supreme Court um, in Williams v. Mississippi in 1898. Um, and so this, these lies serve a purpose. They serve a political purpose. It is about power. Um, and these early liars um, were producing uh, a system of power, one that benefited white Americans at the expense of everyone else, especially. Mm. Mm. And I also get a sense that like today, back then, this group of, you know, there was a group of people who, as you were saying, were lying, but they were doing, if you, it almost seems as though they believed if you keep repeating the lie, if you keep pushing back at the truth, well, not even pushing back, just ignore the truth, just keep telling the lie, the lie becomes the truth. Is yeah. that kind of a fair assessment of, of what was going on? Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's, you know, that is what happened. Um, unfortunately, you know, their, their lies, that's right. Yeah. And their lies are in many of our textbooks today. Um yeah, it, it worked. Um, and to the detriment of Black Americans, and I would argue all of us, right, it would be better if we lived, you know, in a society that one, like actually acknowledged its own history, um, and two, embraced equality and democracy. That would be a good thing uh, for all of us. Um, and that is something that they were unwilling to do. Well, I want to get into some of the questions from um, our audience, but one just popped up like right away. And Dr. Denise Marie, I think this is more of a comment than a question. She said, I disagree. And for black students in K through 12, our history is being attacked via critical theory. It doesn't do our generation a thing to learn in higher ed. The masses do not have that luxury. Reconstruction is very is a very deep topic. Louisiana was supposed to be the blueprint until it was interrupted with the assassination of Lincoln. Um, I'm not sure what it is you're disagreeing with because we're kind of like saying the same thing, if I'm not mm -hmm. I think we're all kind of agree with what she's saying. Am I correct? 
Although I would point out that critical race theory is not being taught in K through K through twelve. No, it is not. It's not being taught at all. But to go to the question, the first question um, was a great one from LaCrissa Sims. She said, did Reconstruction or the end of the war prohibit some slave owners from moving slaves to other states or plantations? Oof, that is, that's a really good question. Yeah. That's a really good question. Um, so no, um, is the very short answer. Um, so if we talk about Reconstruction beginning in 1862, that means during the war, that means when slavery is still legal before the 13th Amendment is passed, enslavers did move enslaved people to other states, uh, especially Texas. Uh, Texas was sort of like the, the I don't know, racist um, last stand, uh, I guess, of, of enslavers. And so a lot of enslaved people from the lower Mississippi Valley uh, wound up uh, in Texas because of that. Um, and so if we think about Reconstruction beginning early like that, then yes. But there's another answer that is also, I don't know, disturbing. I, is, is no other way to say it, um, which is that uh, enslavers after, recon like, so after emancipation, after the 13th Amendment, tried to sort of coerce, trick, or even kidnap uh, enslaved people uh, into slavery in other countries. Um, and so uh, there are cases of people being kidnapped into slavery in Cuba, for instance, uh, which still had slavery, right, after the U.S. abolished it. The same um, in Brazil. There's actually a group of um, Brazilians, I think they were called confederados, if I'm remembering correctly. It's been a while uh, since I brushed up on that. But um, who, again, you know, moved as many enslaved people as they could either coerce or kidnap uh, to come with them to sort of have more enslavement uh, in Brazil. Um, there's also, uh, you know, similar movements uh, in 1868 uh, when Black men are allowed to vote, right? Um, so when the Reconstruction Acts passed and Black Southern men can vote for the first time, um, then white Southerners, again, are sort of thinking, okay, like, how many of these people can I, like, prevent from voting or, like, take somewhere else with me? And so there's a, a group uh, that go to uh, British Honduras, uh, which today is Belize, um, which, which slavery was illegal there, technically, uh, but again, you know, because they're, they don't have the oversight, right, um, they have a lot of power, a lot of leverage um, over formerly enslaved people. Um, and so it's a, that's a complicated answer. The short answer is no, it did not prevent them from doing that. The long um, answer is that, yeah, unfortunately, even after um, emancipation, there are a lot of these sort of really heartbreaking forced uh, relocations that sort of continue to break up uh, Black families, even, again, after emancipation. Wow. Jerome Spears says, all these years later, let me pull this up. All these years later, this nation is still not fixed caps quotes. Um, in your view, can America ever fix itself? Why or why not? Um, I sure hope so. <laughs> I mean, I really do. I, I totally agree with you, though. We are not fixed. Um, and I think part of it, again, is because of all, all the, the lying, right? Um, but it's also because, you know, white Americans have preferred power over equality uh, time and again. Um, that doesn't have to be the case, um, you know, and, and I think that we see larger, you know, movements today that, that perhaps, you know, like I'm thinking about the 2020 protest, you know, is like inspiring some hope, right? I was uh, listening to Angela Davis give a talk um, at Villanova. Angela Davis, can you Villanova? Woo! Um, and, and she was saying that she, this is the most hopeful time that she's ever, you know, had um, as a thinker. You know, and I think about all the things that Angela Davis has been through, right? Uh, for being incarcerated herself, right? Um, and all of the movements that she has been a part of and to say that this is the most hopeful time, like it would be selfish of me to say, you know, I, you know, don't think that we can do it. I, I think we can. Right. Um, but, you know, it, it's it it's a something we have to fight for. I mean, it, it's not an easy battle. Right. And there's a lot of people, as we've been talking about, who are committed uh, to keeping us unfixed. Yeah. See, and again, around the Civil War and now people use the phrase the country is split in half mm -hmm. and i'm going to push back on that gently because i guess in any society you're always going to have a percentage of the population that are at polar extremes now what that percentage is couldn't tell you but even those two percentages added together i just i don't even see those two extremes forming half to me there's a huge range 
I call it the gray area in between. That seems to me to be the the the, the true silent majority. They're they're the quiet ones. They're the ones kind of. I guess they're thinking, well, because it doesn't directly affect me, I don't care. It's got nothing to do with me. I'm living in the suburbs. My life is kind of cool. Whatever's happening in the rest of the country, I don't really care about until they start caring about it. Mm-hmm. I mean, do you have any idea of what that that kind of moving middle quiet percentage is? Yeah, I, I don't, I, I really don't know um, in terms of the size or the scope. I mean, it, it is you know, I think as all of us are like really engaged and thoughtful people, like both historically, but also politically, you know, I think it's hard for us to imagine that group. It, I'll, I'll be honest, it is hard for me to imagine people who, let's say, have like never heard of CRT, which again, like, you know, isn't being taught. We do, that's a whole thing. We don't need to do that thing. But, you know, like, I, I'm always surprised, but there's, there's a lot of people who, you know, like I will mention something and they'll have no idea what I'm talking about, right? And so I do think there is this large group of people, I don't I don't know the size of them, you know, but who are concerned with comfort, right? Uh, perhaps concerned with getting by, perhaps, right? Um, there's a lot in our day to day, right? That we, you know, have to do in order to just survive, especially in this country that is deeply unequal, you know? And so perhaps that's part of the issue too. Um, I can tell you it's extremely unstable um, to have a situation like this, um, and like what we experienced during reconstruction, um, it, it's dangerous. Um, it's dangerous, um, for, you know, people who, you know, are in, um, hyper marginalized communities, but it's dangerous for all of us. Honestly, that's not a society that, you know, we should want to live in. No, I mean, I'm going to say that it never in all my years occurred to me that democracy and that democracy in America could be such a fragile thing. Right. It's always been presented as this robust, eternal, and it's not, because it right. literally is it's hanging by a thread at the minute. Yeah. yeah. Well, I can't believe that we are have gotten to this hour. Like it's already over, you guys. I could talk about this all day because this right here is just a, such a pet peeve of mine, and I I want it, I want to fix it. I want to fix it, and I think that this conversation is a part of fixing it. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Horn or Will, for um, joining us and having this conversation. I have placed in the chat um, his his a chapter that he's written for all of you to get on and check it out and just you know if you go to Villanova it's okay for Georgetown people but um, (laughs) it's okay just long as you go and see Dr. Horns thank you so much so much for being on the show thank you you again for me too thank you so much and again what we wanted to do having to having seen so many documentaries and discussions on the topic was kind of spend this hour talking about aspects of the of reconstruction that Donnie and I just hadn't heard about, hadn't come across in terms of discussions or, or books. So thank you so much for um, for filling in those blanks. Yeah, you did. You really did. You helped me out a lot. I appreciate it. Um, thank you all both for having me. It's been a real pleasure um, and, and I really appreciate it. Yeah. So Brian, you want to talk about what's coming up next week? Ending of oh. the Black History Month. This is awesome, guys. I I don't want to steal your joy. (laughs) I mean, this was something that you wanted, but I got it. You know, okay, so (laughs) next week, we're not going to end on a, um, you know, we have to do genealogy. It's always, sometimes genealogy is just a must. So we're ending Black History Month with a great, great show with Dr. Sean Wallace, Who is Dr. Sean Wallace? He is a professor at Bristol University, and he created, drumroll, the Fugitive Slave Database for this for America. Now, this man is in the UK, but he did this for here. So this is going to be an awesome show. It's going to help you try and find your families. It's going to, you know, we're going to go through all of this. Um, I want to say real quick, Georgia Aiken said you need to come back. <laughs> I would love to. Oh, it's got one. So, uh, yeah, but um, 
as far as that is concerned, thank you again. We look forward to like really, really talking about and learning about this whole fugitive slave database. I don't know about y'all, but I think it's going to be jaw dropping. Mm -hmm. So again, if you think about all of those advertisements that appeared in newspapers for enslaved people who either ran or, or walked away, that, that's what this database does. And it, yeah. it's an awesome, awesome piece of work. I mean, it may have my my guy, the person that, well, no, because he wasn't a slave. Well, he was, but he by the time he did his running, it was well after that, though. But this will be <laughs> neat to learn. And I really want people to, you know, do more research on the Reconstruction era. Learn about it. And then share it. Don't just don't just have it in your in your arsenal. Share it and and help teach it and help pass it on. And and let's start working towards getting this into the school system. I mean, he's our Dr. Horn has already stated he's teaching it. There are other teachers that follow our show. Do you mm -hmm. teach it? And if not, why not? You know, let's let's start really getting into those types of things. And you know, following on from what from what Donia and from Will, from what Will has said, you know, when people push back and they will, mm -hmm. you know, why why do you keep drumming up the past like this? You know, genealogy and fam genealogy and history go together like a hand in glove, and we are literally repeating the past right now. Have been doing since 2016, so to kind of understand the link between the past and now and that continuum. It, it's really important. Yes, yes, yes. And so again, you know, I think the, the future of the country kind of uh, kind of depends on it. It really, man, it really does. It, it really does. So, and, you know, for once, it would be nice to actually fulfill the dream of the Constitution. Period. Just fulfill it. I agree. So, as I always, agree. we appreciate you allowing us. Um, sharing the, this past hour with us and we will see you next week same time 4 p.m eastern standard time on sunday right here on e360 tv as well as youtube and facebook yes yes dr um will if you want to wait for a moment you can okay all right see you guys bye <laughs> bye bye <laughs>